Hey, welcome to the channel of Birdog Austria. My name is Fred Kreusenbrunner. I'm from Austria. I'm the pilot of a Cessna Lima 19er Oscar 1 Bird Dog. This is my baby. It's a 1953 Bird Dog, an A model that flew for the United States Army. My dad flew the Bird Dog for more than 20 years in the Austrian Army and he collected more than 5,500 hours. Luckily, he was my instructor. Thanks, Dad. I'm also a member and safety director of the International Bird Dog Association. Our mission is to keep the stories of the pilot that flew the bird dog in combat alive. This series here now is called Cessna Oscar 1 Lima 19er Bird Dog Legends over Vietnam. We want to keep your stories alive for the next generation. Thank you for your service. This time we have the privilege of speaking with Shotgun33. David McGowan, welcome to this channel. It's a big honor to have you here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> David, can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit and about your family tradition? Because I think your father was also uh, yes. in the army. Yeah. I was born uh, July of uh, 1948. And my father at that time was stationed at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And he was an army aviator from 1942. He was a B-25 instructor pilot. And then uh, Korea, he was a bird dog pilot. And uh, he went on and he retired in 1969, but he was an army aviator. And when I joined the army, after a period of time, I became an army aviator. Um, I, I actually was not trained as an aviator and I got my commission in the army. And then uh, one day I was I was uh, at the airfield and I had to go on board a U.S. Air Force C-141 Starlifter, the big cargo aircraft. And I needed to see the pilot in charge, the, the pilot in command, and he was not there, but his co-pilot was there. And he was a second lieutenant just like me. And I said, that's it. If he can be a second lieutenant and flying this thing, I can be a second lieutenant and go in the Army Air Corps too. So I joined, I, I applied, I became, um, I was I was approved for flight school and I was approved for fixed wing flight school, not helicopters. And uh, at that point in time that for every helicopter, for every Army fixed wing pilot there was, there were four helicopter pilots. That's the difference. So I went uh, initially to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and in Fort Stewart, Georgia, we flew the Cessna T-41. It was a Cessna 172 with a uh, high performance engine, a 213 horsepower engine. And following four months of that, we probably had about 120 hours on us. And then we went to Fort Rucker, Alabama. And at Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, my dad was stationed there. So I got to live at home, but we flew the T-42, which was the Beechcraft Baron the twin engine Baron. And we got our multi-engine training and our instrument training there. And then for the last two months of flight school, we transferred over to the O-1 Bird Dog. And that's when the fun really started. They told us, you are, you are good pilots. You are you're army aviators without the license yet, without the, without the wings. But now we're going to teach you how to be army pilots. And that's what we did in the O-1 Bird Dog. So our training was a little bit different. Uh, and I know this is one of your questions, so I'm just going to anticipate it if you don't mind. Our, tra our training was a little bit different than pilots uh, here in the States that go through as civilians. Civilian, you, you know, you may learn on a Cessna 152 or a 150 or the Diamond aircraft or whatever you learn on. You learn uh, high, you learn altitude work, stalls, uh, steep turns, all of the usual stuff. Uh, and then you learn takeoffs and landings and you learn short field takeoffs and landings. And that's pretty much all you learn. And you always fly off of asphalt or concrete, a hard surface runway. You rarely, probably, if ever, fly off of a grass field. Uh, and you get your license and you might have 50 hours and you're now a private pilot in the United States. Um, U.S. Army training fixed wing was a little bit different. We started in the T-41. 
And then uh, as soon as we learned our upper air work, we learned takeoffs and landings. That's when we started going out in the field and landing in cow pastures. Uh, the Army had agreements with farmers where we could use their cow pastures as long as we cleared the field before we landed. Uh, we also landed on logging trails uh, in Georgia, where we were, and they would cut pine trees. These pine trees would grow 60, 70, sometimes 100 foot tall. And when they would cut them down out in the forest, they put them on the backs of big semi trucks, big 18 wheelers, and they drive them out on a dirt road. Those are called logging trails, and that's what we landed on. So we would, yeah, we would come in and come over the trees, and you had maybe three feet on either side of your wingtips with these 60 to 100-foot pine trees and, and come in and land on the logging trail. And when you took off, you know, you, we talk about taking off over obstacles. We had obstacles, and the obstacles were the 60 to 100-foot pine trees. So that was why our training was... Um, a little bit different than civilian training. And, and it made us good pilots. It made us feel the airplane. It made us know our airplane inside and out and how it would react. So uh, it, it was wonderful. So we finished up flight school with about 220 total hours. And then we went off to uh, Vietnam flying, some of us flying the bird dog. Uh, yes, go right ahead. I, I, my big question is, uh, at most of the... Uh, books that I've read and, uh, and also the videos that I see, uh, the part of the flight school is very little. I'm very interested in about the training uh, which you had in the bird dog because uh, did you use flaps 60? Uh, have you been trained on flaps 60? Because today we all have the bird dogs still flying around the world, but uh, most of us uh, never use flap 60. I do because I was trained by my father uh, not to be afraid of flap 60. But I did a, a research uh, from the FAA accident statistics back to the 1970s. And all the major accidents with ground loop happened with crosswind and flap 60. That's yeah. my question. Did you have a special training for flap 60? No, no. The only thing that we did special was uh, we learned how to fly at altitude with flap 60, slow flight, and learned how our rudder would react and how the ailerons would react and everything is slowed down. So you have to anticipate something happening. But the only other thing we did beyond that when we used flap 60 was um, in training, they would have a 50 foot obstacle. So they had two uh, bamboo poles, 50 feet in the air with a, a, uh, a string with flags on it, red, yellow, green, blue flags across it. And you had to come in over top of that at 60 degrees of flaps and power. And then as soon as you clear that, you drop, you drop the, uh, pull the power back to idle, push the nose down for 50 feet, and then do a quick flare and land. That's the only training we had with the 60 degrees of flaps, but you, you got used to it. So sometimes when we go out to these cow fields and things like that, um, in the bird dog, the instructor might say, uh, you know, use full flaps. So we would practice that way. And so we got a lot of practice in it. So when we got to, uh, when, we, when I got to Vietnam, I was fully versed in using um, 60 degrees of flaps and you're not afraid of it. Not afraid of it in the least. You know that to get out of a situation, if you stall, stall the aircraft low to the ground, you know not to be hesitant with the power, just give it full power because you only have a fraction of a second to save that airplane. So we practiced that and we knew exactly what to do. So I, I used it, I think I used 50 or 60 degrees of flaps. I can remember one time, and that is at my little airstrip out there in Rockjaw where I was. I sent you pictures of that little narrow strip and the strip was only a little bit wider than my landing gear. Um, the helicopters, Shall I wait till you get that up? I try, yeah. I think it's okay. this one. Okay. Yes, perfect. Perfect. If you you see the helicopters on the right side, yeah. You, you see how wide the strip is, and that's just about the width of the landing gear for a bird dog. Um, my my uh, revetment where I kept my airplane was straight down. You see that silver building? Mm -hmm. That was behind where I kept my airplane. Okay, and at the end of the runway, that's the Gulf of Siam. 
And on this side, where you can't see it, that is a uh, canal. So you've got water on both sides. Now, if you look down the runway a little bit, um, you see where the windsock is. I think, you sent, I think you, you sent me here another picture. Is it? Yes, is, yes, I'll show you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, take it from this one. Yes, yes, perfect. So that picture was taken from up by the canal, the, the, the top part of the photograph, okay? And it comes down, and you can see the silver building off to the right, just beyond the intersection of the runway and the road. Now, if you look onto the runway, you'll see it looks like it goes from the canal all the way down to the water. But about one quarter of the way up, if you go north, you see there's a difference in the two in the runway. You see that? Okay. Uh, yeah. From, from that break in the runway back down towards where the, uh, the water is, that's all big rocks. You don't want to land on that. It's very large boulders or, or rocks. <laughs> And the rest of it is all the asphalt. So you see, you're only looking at maybe, I'll say a thousand feet, if that, of paved runway. Okay. So keeping in mind, the helicopters would come in and they would land on either side. So one day I came back. Yes, one day I came back. And I'm getting back to why I used 60 degrees of flaps one time. Uh, I came back to this little airport and I was the only one there. You can see there's three revetments there on the right-hand side. I was in one of them and the other two were empty. So I came back one day and helicopters had landed there from an operation and they had parked on both sides of the runway up beyond the roadway, the top half of the runway. And they didn't take their rotor blades and tie them down. So they were, you know, were in line with the helicopter. They just let them go anywhere they stopped. So they were hanging out over the runway and I could not land. And I came in and I was getting low on fuel. I came in to land and I buzzed the runway several times, you know, and power on, power off and, and, and to do something. I couldn't call them. There's no radio. So the first one was parked. Oh, let's say if you if you go from from the bottom up to the roadway and then keep going, and look on the right hand side. Yes, and you'll see uh, maybe a silver building up there on the right hand side. Yeah. Okay. The helicopters were were parked from there all the way down. So if you look at that part of the runway up to the canal, that's all I had to land on. And it was not very much at all. So I came in there with 60 degrees of flaps and I put it down and I landed it in probably 300 feet. Okay. When I landed it, and that's when I stepped on the brakes and held the stick back. And I was, I got out of the hell out of my aircraft. I shut it down and I got out and I, I told those people exactly what I thought of them because I, I could have, I could have been hurt. You know, I, I, I could have crashed without fuel, but what I was going to do was if, if it push came to show, I was going to land anyway. And I was going to let my two antennas on my wingtips I was going to let them go right down the runway and hit their rotor blades. And that would not have made them happy because then they have to change the rotor blades right there. So yeah. anyway, that's so that's a long answer, but that's the only time I, I ever used um, flaps, uh, 90 or 60 degrees of flaps. Uh, in flight school, uh, you said uh, you came out with about 200 hours, yeah? 220. 220 hours. Yep. Uh, but did you have, uh, how long was your, your, your training with shooting the rockets, the, the 2.75 inch Willy Pete rockets? <laughs> one day. No, really? Just one day. Just one day. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we were at Fort Rucker flying the bird dog, of course. Um, that's a, I was 21 right there. <clears throat> I had just turned 21 when that picture was taken. So uh, one day it was time to, uh, part of our training, I'm sorry, was navigation, learning to fly the airplane and navigating down low to the ground, you know, with charts and everything else and not flying high. But the other part of it was adjusting artillery fire, you know, telling uh, the guns which way to shoot. And that was one day. And then the next day we went out and we learned uh, how to how to fire rockets. They equipped our bird dogs with uh, rocket tubes on each wing and we had, uh, I think, maybe one or two airplanes like that, and we all went out on a bus to this uh, to the firing range, 
And one at a time, we'd get in the front seat with the instructor and we would have rockets. <clears throat> and this was a firing range. So we'd take off, <coughs> pardon me, and we'd go fly. And he would tell us how to do it. And so we got one day and we got to fire two rockets apiece. And that was it. Two rockets. But the way he had us do it was um, he said, once you get to Vietnam, you'll do it whichever way you are more comfortable with. But the way we had to learn it then was to fly 90 degrees off of the target at 2,500 feet, um, pull the power back a little bit and make a 90 degree turn to the left. Right. And then 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 adapt a, uh, a, a gliding approach, if you will, with power, but but at a, at a downward angle and fire at 1,500 feet and full power and pull up and go around. And we got to do that twice. And there was a uh, there was a small concrete building way off to the other side next to it. And there would be a, a guy in there with a pair of binoculars. and He would tell you how close you came to the target, which may have been an old wrecked car or something. And that's all we that's all we fired. Didn't fire another rocket till uh, got into Vietnam. And then it was for keeps. That's interesting. I have on my, my YouTube channel, Bird of Austria, I have all those training videos uh, from the army. Oh, yeah, which yeah. They, which they used for the bird dog. And there is, did, did you also see all those videos or did they come later? Because so far as I know from my research, uh, a lot of bird dogs uh, have been crashed, especially from the Air Force pilots. Yeah, there's a big difference between army and Air Force pilots. But getting back to the videos, uh, we saw them, and that mm -hmm. gave us a little idea of what we were going to get into. We saw the same videos you're talking about, where the guy is adjusting artillery fire. Because if you look at those videos, what's he doing? He's he's going like this and talking into a portable mic. Yeah. We always had... Hold on a second. Let me, I'll be right back. Yeah. Ein Moment, bitte. Uh, you still have your helmet? Yes, sir. Amazing. This is... Uh, This is mine that I, that I use in Vietnam. It's seen a lot of stuff. Oh, wow. And and I keep it. For years, I kept it up in the attic. And then I said, no, I need to bring it down. And I, I keep it over here on a bookshelf. Um, and I, I love this thing. And I got it in May of 1968. I got it in May of 1968 on our first day of flight school. Um And I've, I've used it ever since then. The last time I used it was uh, June of 1972 in Germany, just before I got out of the army, flying a beaver. But you, had, you, have, you were talking about the ground loops for Army versus Air Force. Yeah. I will honestly tell you that the time I was flying bird dogs in, uh, in training in the U.S. Army, which was two months, not a single ground loop took place. Not a single ground loop took place. We had one uh, accident with our bird dog, with a bird dog in that training. And that was two Venezuelan pilots that we had that were um, attached to our class. I don't remember their names, but they were from Venezuela. Spoke limited English, but they were good. But they always flew together. And we call that being stick buddies. Okay. So they were stick buddies uh, and one of them came in and landed. And when he, he landed, he stalled it way too high. Oh. And he came in and smashed it down so hard, Fred, that it broke in half from the aft cockpit. So the guy in the back seat was sitting there by himself and watching his friend go down the runway with the airplane with the prop still going. And he's driving down there and he can't understand why he's looking straight up at the sky <laughs> until he looks back and there's concrete runway. Um, nothing ever happened to them, but that's the only incident that we ever had. They were not injured in any way. So we never lost anybody. Uh, we never had a single ground loop, not a one. And that, and that tells me something. Well, let me go back now to compare it, to answer your question, to compare that to the Air Force. Um, Air Force pilots are excellent pilots. Excellent. But they're lousy single-engine pilots. They were trained in, in uh, 
a, back then they were trained in a, in a, a prop airplane and then they immediately went to jets and the rest of their training has all been high performance jets. When they, and they go from flight school, they get their wings and they go off to uh, F4s, F100s, F105, 131s, C130s, all of those things. And they're flying high performance airplanes all the time. They, they never learn how to fly small airplanes proficiently, never. So they got selected to go to Vietnam as a FAC after they had already been involved in uh, B-52s, 141s, F-4 Phantoms, all of that stuff. And now all of a sudden they're being told they're going to be a FAC in Vietnam and they're going to fly the O-1. A lot of them did not like that whatsoever. Why? Because they're, they fly fast movers. That's what they want to be. They want to be, you know, they want to hold that, that, that hat, you know, cocked off to an angle. And we never had that sort of training. We learned how to fly on little airplanes and stayed with little airplanes. So when it got time to go to Vietnam, they maybe have had six, I guess maybe something like 60 hours in a bird dog. And that's not that many. I mean, huh. we had, that's all we had, but our whole training was based upon pretty much single engine airplanes and we knew how to fly low and slow. So uh, when they got to Vietnam, they had a lot of ground loops, ground loop accidents. They remember their thinking is 600 miles an hour. Our thinking is hundred miles an hour. There's a big difference. Um, the other thing was because of the difference in them and us, the air force would not let them fly into some fields. Now, I don't know about the rest of Vietnam, but I was down south and I flew, you saw my field, how short it was and how narrow. Five miles south of that was an airfield that was like 3,500 feet long and maybe, maybe 100 feet wide. No control whatsoever. No, no air, no traffic control, no tower, no nothing. But the Air Force made them fly there and not where I was. <clears throat> I was just outside of the town. I was very close to where our headquarters was. The little advisory group that I was with, they were way, they were down south. They couldn't even come up there. You don't drive your Jeep up that way through that kind of country. So that's the difference. They, they wouldn't let them fly because they didn't have, they weren't as proficient as we were. We flew out of there all the time. In fact, a big difference was, uh, I've told some people this, when I was there for that whole year flying out of, Rock, well, 10 months out of Rockjaw, my platoon leader never came out to see me. My mm -hmm. company commander never came out to see me. No one ever came out to see me except the guy who flew in the province next to me. That was it. Nobody wanted to come into that little field because if you mess up, it's it's all over. You know, you're very short runway. So you, you've got to you got to be able to land on one wheel and, and, and take that thing down slowly and taking off the same way. You've got to be able to hold that stick over or, you know, you've got to have confidence in your abilities. And and even some of the army pilots didn't have it, did not have it. When I got promoted to captain, my commanding officer did not want to fly out to my airfield. I had to meet him at another airfield that was big and wide. So uh, I'm not a super pilot, but I was flying out of there all the time. And I was so used to it and they were not used to it. And they knew that they're, and it's a smart thing on their part. They knew that they're, they were, they, they were no match for that field until they had more practice. Uh, okay. I, have a, I have a question about yeah. this picture, which uh, I shared uh, some seconds before. Yeah. Uh, what kind of, of seat is this? Is this a, 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 a protection seat against gunfire? Yes. yes. Um, the seat, it has the, it, it has the standard bird dog seat that you have. Yeah. Okay. But what they do is they add to it and they make it an armored seat. So I had on my back coming up to where you see it on, on the back, you can see it comes to just below the shoulder blade. Um, it's, it's probably maybe a half inch thick. Uh, I, I don't know what it was. It was steel or something like that, but it was armor plating. So you had that on the back side, and you had that underneath of you on the bottom and you had this on both sides and you can see that it protects your side. Now, when you open the door, do you see, you see the, uh, the, the uh, silver hinge on the back of that? Yeah. 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 
Yep. So when you open the door with the handle, you reach up and you take that handle right there, that silver handle, you pull it up and that's a pin and it releases the side part of the seat. So it swings back and you can get in and out. Ah, uh, it opens like a door. Okay. Yeah. So when you get in, you, you climb in, you get in the seat. And then the next thing you do is you just, your crew chief has that thing and he just swings it forward and it locks in forward for you. So that's uh, an armored, that's an armored seat. Uh, I never saw it uh, on 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 uh, forward air controllers from the Air Force because, as uh, so far as I know, they used to sit on flak vests. Yep, the Air Force never had that. Um, I don't know why. They always had more money than the Army ever did, but they uh, they they didn't have that, and and we did, and I'm glad we did. Now the Army, the this is a G model, okay, and it used to be an A model. I sent you a picture showing several bird dogs lined up together, but it's a picture of my airplane when it was with the um, the uh, Wisconsin Air National Guard. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from there, it went to Wichita, Kansas to Cessna, and it was an A model. And they, tra they, they reworked it and they rebuilt it from the bottom up and they made it a brand new G model. And that's when it came to me in Vietnam with zero time engine, fresh wings, fuel cells, uh, you know, all, all of the stuff and all the new avionics and the armored seat. OK, that's where it all came from, the armored seat. Now, a lot of airplanes did not have an armored seat for the Army. So if you got a new airplane, you got the armored seat. So what the Army did was and this is very, it's, I guess it's fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it. But the Army said. If you don't have an armored seat, you can. You, we want you to fly with a parachute on your back. Okay. And the 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 ones that did not have an armored seat were the old D models. Excuse me, the Delta models. We either had Delta or Golf models. I had the new G model, but before that, I had a G a, a D model, and the D model had uh, variable pitch prop things like that, but. <laughs> You, we flew with a parachute and the thinking there is if a round comes up from the back, it's not going to go through the parachute. So you'll be safe. I flew, I got my G model uh, after I was there for about a month and a half. So I always had an armored seat. And the unfortunate thing is um, when I was back at Sok Trang, that big airfield I showed you earlier, I had a roommate and uh, that roommate had a D model and he did not have an armored seat so he had to fly with a parachute but he refused to fly with a parachute did not like it and the platoon leader never forced him to wear it and that's when the round came up from the bottom so if he had had an armored seat or the parachute he would have been okay now the air force you're correct the air force always had a parachute they never flew with an armored seat that i saw mainly because their airplanes were old army hand-me-downs. They didn't get fresh airplanes out of Wichita like we did. Okay. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, uh, how was the difference between the D and the G model? The one had a constant speed prop and your bird dog, uh, the, the G model had a fixed pitch. A fixed pitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fixed pitch. But, uh, what was the difference? Because even with all this armor protection you had around you, it, it was very heavier. Well, yeah, it was a heavier airplane, but um, it had been beefed up in certain points to, to be able to carry extra weight. And the wings had been beefed up to carry uh, four hard points, eight yeah. rockets. Okay. So those are some of the things they did, but they didn't change the engine. And I'm not sure what the gross weight, you know, went up to, but... I never noticed any difference. Okay. In fact, I will tell you this. When I picked up, they called me one night and they said, tomorrow go up to, um, there was an Air Force base a little bit to our north, uh, about maybe 20 miles, 30 miles to our north. And it was called Bintui. And they said, go up to Bintui and pick up a new G model. So I, I did, me and my crew chief, got in my airplane and we flew up to Bintui the next morning 
taxied it up, and the mechanics there took my rocket pods off and put them on the new airplane with rockets, so I had the same weights, right? And then I, I signed for the airplane, and it had, oh, radios were all the same. Everything was pretty much the same, but I did have a UHF. I didn't have that before. So I had UHF, VHF, and two FM. So anyway, I taxied out, and when I poured the power to it and I took off, that thing just climbed unbelievably sharp. It was beautiful. I was so excited. So was it heavier? I think the difference between the uh, the, the 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 prop, you know, made that made the difference. The the D model weighed a whole lot more with all that prop stuff going on, and and the armored seat is negligible. That's not very much at all. But that thing had much better performance, and I really preferred the performance of the G model because the D model was faster by about. Mm -hmm seven to 10 miles per hour, maybe. And the G model was slower, but over there, you're not out to set any speed records. You know, you don't want to fly from point A to point B as fast as you can. You're out there doing a job. So you, you don't care about the speed, but what you do care about, and this is what the G model offered you when you finish your rocket run and you want to pull out and you pour the power to it, that thing's going to climb and get you out of trouble a lot faster than the D model will. Plus the D model has more that can go wrong. Yeah, the, of course. Of yeah, course. The, G, the G model just, just hit the power and off she goes. Because you're saying about flying, uh, it was not a, a method to fly fast. Uh, right. Did you have a special uh, maneuver st strategy to not getting hit, never maintain the same altitude. Uh, right. What what did you do? Well, you're right. We never maintained the same altitude. And believe me, when I say I was out there alone, I didn't have anybody with me. I didn't have any other pilots with me until my last two months. And that's when my new replacement came in. So he had two months to learn the area and fly with me and learn how to do it. But uh, uh, altitude, yes. So so you never had a local observer, a native observer sitting in the back? Two times that I was there. Once when I was in Sok Trang and once when I was in Rockjaw, they sent me an observer, a qualified observer. And we went out, there was an operation and he was doing the talking with his helmet, you know, through talking to the, uh, to the Vietnamese troops down below. And, uh, and he got sick because I was at about 500 feet and it was bumpy. And I was doing, you know, steep turns like this all the time, trying to keep us where we needed to be. And he got sick and he never came back. He, <laughs> he, he tapped me on the shoulder and then he was on the microphone and, and he said, uh, he says, die we, die we. And that's for captain. And I went, yeah, what? And I turned around and looked at him and his face was green and I knew what was going to happen. And I, and he says, he was doing this, like, where do I throw up? And I said, don't throw up in the helmet. That The helmet was my crew chief's helmet. Don't throw up in the helmet. I said, stick your head out the window and do this. And he did. So when we landed, my crew chief looks at the side of the airplane and it's got rice and fish heads and everything else all over it. But I said, I said, it's a lot better than having your helmet full of puke. So anyway, so I had two observers. That, that was it. And it was always by myself. Okay. Now, some now sometimes, Fred, you, you say, was anybody with me? When I was out doing my regular business for the day, you know, turning and looking and flying and, and looking for stuff, visual reconnaissance, we called it. Um, at the end of, there you go. <laughs> at the end of uh, probably three days, four days a week, we had operations going on. And back then, there was no form of secure communications from our little headquarters downtown to the troops out in the field to say, you're going to have an operation tomorrow. There was no way to tell them what to do. So they had to coordinate with all of these little outputs <clears throat> that were each going to put, you know, a company or a platoon out there. <clears throat> so we did message drops, real live message drops. They would take, they would take the, here's the chart that they're going to use for tomorrow with grease pencil on it and they take them do you know what onion skin is yeah okay very thin paper they would lay it over top of it and they would mark certain places where it's so you know it's all set up 
And then they would draw what you're supposed to do. And they would take that and they would fold it. And they took a hand grenade canister, which is a, a piece of cardboard. You've seen them. They open up like this and they would put it inside and they would seal it. And then they would cut a piece of onion skin about this, this big and about that wide. And they would write the coordinates on there for where the, I'm supposed to drop this. Okay. And they would stick it in the canister with the tail hanging out. So when I threw it out of the airplane, the black canister is coming out with a white streamer on it, the white tail, so they could see it. And that white tail told them where they were going to be. And then, you know, they match it up with their charts, right? And everything worked fine. The only thing I did differently was um, I would, before I took off, I would sometimes have five or six of these to drop. And we always dropped them at last light, just before dark. That way the VC, you know, wouldn't see it or whatever. But I always put a rock in that canister to hold, to give it a little bit more weight. Okay. Oh, okay. From, from the runway, those big rocks I was telling you about, I put them in there. Uh, so, so when I did that, a lot of times um, a sergeant who was working in our uh, operations center downtown, um, he never got to fly. And he would come out and he would bring those to me and he would say, can I go along with you? And that's when I would have somebody in the back seat, and that's it. Interesting. No, because I was so far as I know, the uh, forward air controllers from the Air Force, most of the time they had a guy sitting in the back. Yeah, we never had anybody in the back. That guy never came back to me. So I did my job on <laughs> visual reconnaissance by myself, but I had that guy in the back seat most times to do the, uh, the drop, and he would hold it out the window, and I would fly. I would fly over. And when I flew over, I would cycle the prop. And, you know, the engine backfires. Yeah. Right. So I would get the engine to backfire once or twice. And they knew I was coming. And I would just drop down from a thousand feet and come down in a real steep, fast turn. And when I pull out about five feet, 10 feet off the rice paddies, I would uh, full power and I would fly over their little triangular outpost. And I would pull it up to maybe just above their little flagpole. And I would tell him in the back, you know, drop it. And he would throw it down. And it would, if I did it right, it would land right inside the compound. Okay. So that was the only time. They just wanted to fly in the back seat with me. So well, I was by myself. And I love this picture here. Um, this was done by his, um, his autograph is in the lower right-hand corner. And he got in touch with me and he does um, computer-generated Uh, art, CAD drawing, computer generated drawings. And he told me he would like to do this for me. And, uh, you know, what do you, he says, you know, I'll send it to you. Tell me what you think. And he said, send me a picture of your airplane. So I have a model that I bought. It was already completed, but I repainted it and I put the stencils on it and I put my numbers, I put the triangle and I put 33 like my airplane was. I don't like the way he's got the rockets, but I could not show him what I wanted. But other than that, it's a perfect rendition of my airplane. So I sent it to him and he did this and I had him put my, my 221st patch up there and uh, I bought it. It cost me $300. Yeah, and, but and I, it's, I had it. Huh? It's, it's worth every dollar because it's an yep. amazing uh, drawing. I like it. It is. It, I, I love it too. See, at first he had it uh, up in the blue sky and I said, I wasn't that high, but he didn't know how to draw a lot of the, uh, the terrain below it. And, and he's done a good job without having to go into detail. And I let him put some clouds in there, which is okay. I never flew that high, but the bottom line is it, it helps the airplane stand out, you know? Mm -hmm. He's even got the, the the yellow tips on the end of the prop, right? You know, it's 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 really cool. He's a, he's do you a know guy. do you know how the how all those antennas? Do you know the function of all those antennas you have? Well, uh, yes, to a degree. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I do. The ones on the wingtips. Those are FM radio for talking to the ground, the ground troops. And for talking to my uh, my operations headquarters, where I was I was with the advisors. So that's for FM radio. Okay, uh, two FM radios, one in the back seat, one in the front seat. Mm -hmm. So there's two antennas. I can talk to on either one. 
I can use two radios at one time. So those are those are called um, they're called two nine two nine or two two nine two. It's fine though. It's fine. Okay. Okay. They're called two nine or two antennas, and they use them on tanks and things like that for FM work. Mm -hmm. So they outfitted them for the army and they put them on the wingtips, and it works fine. Now, if you go back, you see the. Um, uh, you you see the uh, the wire going from the front of the cockpit roof back to the tail. That's the uh, ADF antenna. Uh, okay. Yep. We didn't have uh, we didn't have the the circular ADF antenna. We had that wire antenna right there. That was the ADF. You see the blade antenna. That was for VHF UHF communications. And you see the two little wires or antennas on the uh, horizontal stabilizer. Yeah, they called a uh, homing antenna. So far yeah. as I know, we called them cat whiskers. Okay, right. A cat has whiskers coming out like this. Yeah. We called them cat whiskers, but they were FM homing antennas. You're right. You're absolutely right. I never used it. I never. We were never taught how to use it. I never needed it for anything. Uh, now, other places uh, like up north, where where Fred was, or not Fred, uh, where Doc Clements was. Um, they had a lot of jungle. As you can see, I didn't have very much jungle at all. So they used that a lot when they were talking with troops on the ground that weren't quite sure where they were. And they could home, these guys with the antennas like that, they could home in on their FM radio signal. Okay. And they would fly a, a, a direct line to them. And then when they got overhead, the guy on the ground would say, you're, you're overhead right now. Oh, okay. Interesting. I, I didn't know that. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yep. But they, they, you, they, home antenna, a, you home in on an FM signal. Yes. Go ahead. The, the homing antennas were not used uh, to, to listen to, to the VC or so. Oh, nope. nope. That's, that's entirely different stuff. Um, we had special airplanes for that with special antennas. No, this was not for anything like that. Nothing. Uh, I have another question for you, uh, because uh, you sent me this picture here. Where, uh, I think it's a shot uh, from the window outside. Let me see. Yeah, here. Uh, yeah. What, do we, what do we see here? Well, we see the delta where I was, and we see the delta in the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. this, this is their rice growing season. Um, and what you're seeing going from the... Uh, uh, the the lower the lower left to the upper right that's that's a, a road yep that's a road that sits up off on a, a on a dike it's a wide dike but that's a road and you and it goes over to another area where uh, there was more trees and things like that but as you can see in the monsoon season everything is flooded everything has got three to four feet of water maybe two feet sometimes but a lot of water. Uh, and even that is, is if you look at it carefully, you can see some uh, rice paddy squares in underneath the water. But in the monsoon season, when you have it like this, everything gets flooded. The, the rivers and canals flood and it just covers everything. It doesn't hurt the rice that much, okay? Because as long as the stalks are sticking up out of the water, they get the proper sunlight and the, the, the stalks are buried in the mud anyway. And that's what uh, you're looking at. That's the territory we flew over. What was the biggest threat when, when, when you flew there in, in Vietnam? I, I always ask, the Viet Cong knew that the U Bertox pilots were out there. Yeah. Didn't the, the Viet Cong also have planes to shoot you down? No. They had no aviation assets whatsoever. The okay. North Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese had an air force and they had jets and they would fly against our jets that were coming to attack Hanoi. Down south, they had no aviation whatsoever. They had no helicopters. They had no fixed wing. They had no jets. Mm -hmm. So it was just us. So we had no aerial threats. So our biggest threat was ground fire. And down in the Delta, uh, the, the difference between me and Doc Clements is down in the Delta, the VC could see and hear us coming from miles away. In the North where he was with a lot of the jungle, they can't hear you until the last minute. And then the, when they look up, they see you for a second and then you're gone. Mm -hmm. 
but they have to fly very low to see down through that jungle. We could fly a little bit higher, but not much. We flew between uh, right around 800 feet, seven to 800 feet. Anything higher than that, I can't see what I want to see on the ground. Anything lower than that, and I'm just a sitting duck. Okay, but how did you identify the VC? Because uh, as I heard a story, I don't know, was it Charlie Finch or another guy uh, talking that he always flew at the same area and suddenly he saw a house uh, and there were 15 trousers hanging outside. Yeah, so he knew there was the VC yeah. inside. Yeah. Or you saw, you know, you fly over that territory in your province every day. And you know, for example, maybe that house has um, in the fields two water buffalo and a sampan. Now, all of a sudden, he's got five sampans and that ain't right. Okay. So you flew at 800 feet right around there. You never flew looking forward. You always flew and you always had the windows open, not the back windows. Because if you fire a rocket with the back windows open, the sparks come in and land on the seat and now you're in, on fire. So we keep the back windows closed when you fire rockets. Um, but you kept the side windows open. First off, because it's a lot cooler on you. Second off, because you can hear the ground fire. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the other reason is if the ground fire hits the plexiglass window, you get, you know, pieces of plexiglass in your face. Okay. Yeah. So we kept them open. Um, and you flew looking out the back all the time. There's nothing in front you're going to hit because we didn't have any mountains. So when you flew, you're holding the stick and you're looking back this way, both sides. And you're doing that for a reason. If you fly over VC, they see you coming. They know you're looking at them. When you fly past them, they think you're gone. And that's when they'll pick up a rifle and shoot at you. So you always fly behind you, looking back here. If they're hiding something, they're gonna. If they're hiding, when you're gone, they'll come back out. And if you're looking back there, you see them. And so, how do you identify the VC? Well, if you see them shooting at you, that's a bad guy. Yeah. They all look alike, the same black pajamas, so you can't tell. So you would fly over uh, maybe a maybe an intersection of a canal. Yeah. And there's trees around there, okay? Two canals, and there's trees all the way around it. And that's where bunkers are going to be underneath. Mm -hmm. And you don't know, because you can't go down low enough to look and see if there's a bunker. They have a camouflage. So if you have a, a just a, a, a thought that something's not right, or just for the hell of it, let's try something. So you would fly in circles around it. Now, put your self in the position of the vc and they see you up there and they go okay just wait a minute he'll be gone but you start circling and they go what did he see does he know something we don't know well if nothing happens if they say no shh, don't say a word don't move and he goes away you're okay but what if you are there and he's circling all the time and what if he takes a smoke grenade and drops it Mm -hmm. now you're pretty sure that he has seen you and you're going to come out and start shooting. Now you got him. Okay. okay. You don't do that every day, but yeah, you drop smoke grenades all the time like that. And you go, you fly around things or you come back and fly, you know, circle figure eights over top of it, just waiting for somebody to do something. And if they're there, they're going to come out and shoot at you. Okay. They they want to get you before you bring in the helicopters or artillery or anything like that. So that's, that's how we, we, it was a waiting game. That's how we figured out where they were. If, if sometimes, sometimes you're looking, you know, and you see a little twinkle way out here, you go, somebody's shooting at me way over there. So you fly over that way. It, it, you don't fly away from it. You fly towards it. That's what we always did. You fly towards it. You're not doing your job if you're flying away. You got to go towards it. People go, oh, you might get killed. So, yeah, I might. But my job is to go find them and eliminate them somehow. So, and we, to eliminate them, uh, we used our rockets if we needed to. And like I said, they were high explosive all the time. Never flew except one time with uh, Willie Pete, white phosphorus, one time. One time. 
Everything else was high explosive. Bird dogs were not allowed to carry high explosive except for two companies. My company, the 221st, and the next one up, the 199 uh, Swamp Fox. Ah, sw Swamp Fox was the... Yeah, um, I know. Sure. Yeah, sure. Exactly. They were allowed to carry high explosive also because where we were down south, we didn't have big, huge you know, units that could come out and do stuff. We didn't have the 1st Infantry Division. We didn't have any of that. We had just us. And if we needed artillery, the artillery was 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 not always uh, accessible because it was stationed at these little outposts all over the place. And the VC knew to go between them where they couldn't be hit by artillery. So I rarely fired artillery because the VC would always stay away from that artillery circle of death um, and mortars and things like that. So I would ask for permission to shoot my rockets and I would fire at them. A lot of times they would say, no, don't shoot. Okay. Then we'd shoot anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing we could do is if there were helicopters in the area we could call for gunships and the gunships <laughs> would come in and they would take care of it uh the other thing was the navy came in with a uh with an lst that's a landing ship tank it's the one where the doors open up on the front yeah okay and they parked them off the coast because they they were a rebuild facility for PBRs. Do you know what a PBR is? No. A PBR is a Navy boat, and you've seen pictures of them. PBR stands for Patrol Boat River. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Yep, that's where the little riverine forces were. So yeah. they were based on land, not far from where I was, but when they needed to be repaired and rebuilt, they would take them to the mothership about a mile off coast, and they would rebuild them there and take care of them. Now, on, in addition to that, the Navy had a heliport on top, and they had two Huey gunships, and they were called Sea Wolves. When the Army got new Huey gunships, they got the um, they got the C model and something else. They the B model Hueys were underpowered, so the Navy said, "Hey, can we have them?" And they gave them to the Navy. The Navy outfitted them with rockets and made them gunships, right? And they put two of them on every LST, two of them. And they called their call sign was Seawolf. And they were there to support the PBRs and the Navy SEALs. We had a SEAL team too. So that's what they did. So if I needed, um, if I needed gunship support on anything, I rarely called for the Army because they, they were probably 50 miles away. We didn't have them down there. So I would get on the UHF radio and I would call the uh, LST and I would call for sea wolves and they would be there in 15 or 20 minutes and ready for a fight. They love to fight. That's what they love to do. Those guys were, they were like this big. Okay. <laughs> they had a set on them. I got, I was flying along one day. Um, I used them several times, but I was flying along one day 800, 1,000 feet, and I just happened to glance over to my left, and there's a line of, of hooches there, just like five or six of them, right? Nothing big, and I'm flying, and in the doorway of one of them, because I'm low enough, I could see the doorway, I see twinkling lights. You know what that is? That's AK-47, that's gunfire. Oh, God, okay. It twinkles like a Christmas light, okay? Because he's got it on automatic. He's going, Brr, and every time it's a muzzle flash, it looks like twinkling Christmas lights. So I see that I see the gunfire and I don't hear anything, but I call in to my tactical operations center and I give them the grid coordinates. And I said, shotguns get receiving fire, request permission to return fire with my rockets by myself, way out in the middle of nowhere. You know, the, I stop and think about that all the time. And I go, diving down anything could happen and i'm you know 20 30 miles from the nearest friendly person and no airplanes around to come save me so anyway um they they came back and they said permission is denied well maybe one of the vietnamese guys in the vietnamese tactical center maybe his cousin lives in that little village and he doesn't want you shooting at his cousin anything like that okay so that happened a lot so 
I thought about what am I going to do? Well, I want to pay this guy a visit. So I called the sea wolves. They were there in 10 minutes. They came out there and they said, okay, shotgun, where is he? And I said, you see those five hooches? They went, yeah. I said, it's the second one from north to south. It's the second one in. He went, oh, okay. So one of them goes over and he's circling at about three or 400 feet. The second one, this is no lie, Fred. The second one comes in and he comes over. And I described it in my book. He comes over that hooch. And he says, hey, shotgun, is this the one? And I said, yeah. And his, his gunner, goes out and stands on the skids and he's got hand grenades and he's throwing them through the roof and then they fly off. <laughs> I'll tell you, set like this, but that's the sea wolf. So you go in there and read the stories about the sea wolves and, and that's the ones that I worked with. Um, that's what I had to do with the sea wolves, but the sea wolves, you'll be thoroughly fascinated with the sea wolves and how they work. Okay. And uh, for me, uh, you are a very uh, special pilot in Vietnam because so far as I know, the Air Force was only controlling the Air Force, the Army, the Army, but you were somewhere in the middle and you had the, the yeah. chance to speak with a lot of guys. Yeah. Most of the, uh, the up north where Doc Clements was, um, most of the fast uh, fighters were put in by facts yeah. and they were Air Force facts because they were trained to do that. Where Doc Clements was, he was actually trained to do that. So he was one of only a handful of Army pilots that were qualified to, to do Air Force fact work with, with fast jets. Now, in the southern part, as you go south in Vietnam, Army pilots were not allowed to do that because they had plenty of Air Force facts to go around. Now, the Air Force facts, well, at that, now let's go further south to where I am. And where I am, the Air Force facts handled all of that stuff. I handled artillery and helicopters. Mm -hmm. I did all of that. The Air Force didn't mess with any of that. They just did nothing but strikes. We, on the other hand, went out every morning and starting about nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning, went out and I flew a minimum of four hours a day, unless there was weather, mm -hmm. but four hours at least. Some days six, some days eight, one day 12. But you go out and you fly. And... When I, when I would get up in the morning, I would meet my crew chief outside of our little bunker area and we would get in the Jeep and we would drive through this little town and we would go to the mess hall and we would have breakfast. And right next to the mess hall was the tactical operations center called TOC. It's just a small building with big antennas and the U.S. is here and the Vietnamese are over here. And I would walk into the TOC and I would talk to, if there was an officer there, it didn't matter. I'd talk to the sergeant on the radio and I would say, you know, what do we got going today? Because I didn't know a lot of stuff unless I dropped messages the night before and I knew there was going to be an operation. But sometimes the operation didn't start until one o'clock, maybe nine o'clock, maybe 10 o'clock. So he would tell me and I would say, OK, and I'll be out there and I cover it. You know, I fly over it. Then I come back and get more gas. I go out and I've got my rockets. But when we had an operation like that, it came with helicopters and gunships. So I wasn't needed with rockets a lot, but I did the over the aerial side. So I controlled the sky. OK, unless we needed jets. And then the Air Force came in, did the jets and went home. So I go over there and I'd find out what's happening. If nothing was happening that day, I would tell him because Rockjaw sat right in the middle of the province. So I could go north or south. Remember, it's very narrow, but I would say, okay, I'm headed, I'm headed south today. I'm going to check out now. Okay, fine. So when I took off, I would call on the FM radio uh, to the TOC and just say, uh, you know, whatever his call sign was, maybe his call sign was um, Hotel Rascal. Okay. I'm just coming up with anything. They always came up with call signs that were hard for the Vietnamese to say. Okay. They always, they always had an L or an R or something like that where the Vietnamese would screw it up. So okay. if, the VC, if the VC ever got on the radio, they would mess it up. Okay. So um, how about um, Lightning Rascal? Okay. They can't say that. So I would just call and go, uh, Lightning Rascal Shotgun 33 is airborne. And he would go, Roger that. And then I go off and I do my thing. And that's it. And I'll be flying over it. I'll just be going out all over this territory, way out there. 
you know, think of think of yourself, um, think of yourself flying away from your home base, you know, 15, 20 miles, and then go down to 500 feet. And then pretend like you're getting shot at and pretend like you get hit and, and sit there and pretend like, what the hell am I going to do? I'm hit, I'm hurt, or my airplane's hit, my engine's hit. You know, what am I going to do? There's nobody out here. I don't know specifically what my grid coordinates are. I can give it, but I've got to do it fast. So we always kept the UHF. Um, well, the UHF, we had a uh, whole different frequencies. All we had to do was push a button for it. But there was a red button. And if you were an emergency, hit the red button, and it automatically dials in 2430. Guard, right? That's the emergency frequency for UHF. If it was VHF, I wasn't talking with anybody on VHF. I always had 121.5 in there, right? That's the guard frequency. Now, FM, I'm talking with my TOC if I need them. So anyway, um, if something happens, I just reach up to the audio panel that, you know, you have it in yours, and I flip it to UHF, VHF, and I, I start screaming, you know, whatever, and see if anybody's in the area that can help me. So just imagine, and that's that's what something, it goes through your mind every day, and it scares you. But you got a job to do, and you don't want to spend the night, if at all possible, in a little bamboo cage. So anyway, I'd fly around and I'd do all of those things. And every once in a while, I'd fly over or near one of those little triangular outposts that we had. And the guy would come up with the radio because I'm on the same frequency. And he would say, shotguns, that you? I go, you got it. He'd say, yeah, three, three. Listen, can you check out this spot for me over here? We heard something last night. Then I'll go check it out. Okay. I'll work for them. You know, I'll do whatever they want. Or he may say, we've got a patrol out you know two clicks to our west and he'd give me a bearing you know from his outpost he would say it's 235 at two miles or two clicks whatever and he'd say uh can you cover him for a little bit you bet it so i'll go down and I'll, I'll, I'll fly over i won't see him i may not see him and he'll call me somebody will call me on the radio and say you're overhead it's okay fine i'll just stay in the area way out there you know somewhere out there because he may be waiting in ambush Mm. And doesn't want to be seen. So you do all that stuff. Um, sometimes, uh, what was it? Every once in a while in the morning, I'd go out to the field, to that little strip, and a Jeep would pull up and a, a Marine Corps captain would get out. Now, I was an Army captain. He was a Marine Corps captain. And he was what they call a Mustang. A Mustang is a Marine that starts off at the bottom and works his way up, right? So he's tough. And he comes out and he was a nice guy. He goes, he goes, Hey, David, you want to go fly today? <laughs> and he, he knew I said, yeah. So he'd say, okay, we got the rocket ship today. And the rocket ship was a um, Navy ship that was like an LST, but I forget what it was called, but it had on the stern, you know, the back part, it had two big squares and they were full of five inch Zuni rockets. Oh, okay. And I fired 2.75 inch. These are five inch. So they're like this, right? Yeah. And a long range. And they are they are gyroscopically stabilized. So the waves won't affect their and their computer generated target acquisition. So we would fly and he's in the back seat and he would say, This this whole area down here is full of VC. Now there are some civilians down there. He says, but we dropped leaflets and we told him to get out. It's a free fire zone. You've heard of them. Anything that moves down there is eligible to be shot. I said, all right, I couldn't do anything about it. And he would call and talk to them on UHF and give them the frequency. And those big things would move around and get the proper angle. And they would, they would fire a marking rocket, just one rocket. And I don't know if you're familiar with how to mark, uh, how to adjust artillery. When it's fired, the guy who's doing the firing will say, um, uh, what do you say? Oh, shot out. In mm -hmm. other words, the shot is out. He'll say shot out. And the guy in the back seat goes shot out, Roger. He didn't say over and out. He said, Roger, leave it open. And five seconds before that thing hits, he'll say splash. So as soon as he says splash, 
you better start looking. You got five seconds and okay. look at your target and see where he hits. And he'll say, Roger, he'll say left 50 drop 20. You correct him. Okay. Yep. And that's, yep. that's called adjusting the fire left, right, up, down, left 20, add, add, drop, whatever. Um, and then he would say fire for effect. And all 16 of those rockets would go shooting out there. And when they hit, it was when they hit, I was at a thousand feet and my, my window, my side panels, your, your side windows are shaking like this with the uh, shock waves coming up. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Just amazing. That's how powerful it was. And you don't want to be down there on the ground when that hit. And he would do that two, three times. And then we'd go back home. He'd get in his Jeep and go, see you later. I never knew where he lived. Somewhere in that little town, he lived there. He was the only Marine that I knew. So we used to do, I, I would do that. Yeah. Is there, is there, what was the main difference? Uh, the forward air controllers, as far as I know, they supported always the ground troops. Right. The ground right. troops gave them a call, and they yep. took care about close air support. Yep. Uh, and 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 you, let me say, you've been more like a cowboy, huh? More like it, yeah. It's not as formal. Yeah. Yeah, because remember, the only people we had on the ground were the Vietnamese troops, the, the Army of Vietnam, Arvins, and one or two advisors that were with them, okay? So if they got into trouble... Uh, the Delta trouble is different than up north. Their trouble down there, they could sometimes back away from, or um, I would bring in artillery or, you know, stuff like that. Um, it, it took too long to get the Air Force down there. Mm -hmm. It took too long, unless it was pre-planned. And we knew they were going to show up at a place at 10 a.m. But but to have, some, have the Air Force come out at the drop of a hat, not down there. Up north, yes. American troops get into trouble. They call for artillery or call for uh, gunships or uh, fast movers, and they got them. It was it was way, way different down south where we were, where, where I was and the other pilots that flew at the other provinces. But it was different, different flying. You, you asked to shoot them, and uh, they told you, no, you're not allowed. Wasn't that yeah. frustrating? Yes, very frustrating. Very frustrating because you knew there's somebody shooting at me. Yeah. But... but Somebody over in their headquarters, he's got a, a third cousin that lives somewhere near there. And he would say, no, or that's my where my dad was born, you know. And anyway, he has a relationship with that little village and he didn't want me to shoot. So, you know, I'd have the sea wolves come in and do it or I'd drop hand grenades. I could do that, too. Oh, OK. And I only I only did that when if something was happening down there and I couldn't shoot, and I couldn't get anybody else there to help me. When I flew back that day, and I'd go back and have lunch, and I'd go to the mess hall, I'd steal their little glasses. Mm -hmm. You know, little, little juice, not the big glass, but the little one, the little round like orange juice glass, and a hand grenade fits in there perfectly, with a spoon and all, fits inside. And the top part sticks out. So I would fly over it, and I would I would get over where I wanted to be and I'd hold it out the window so I didn't drop it in the airplane, hold it out the window and pull the pin. OK, now I can I can do what I want because the pin is stuck inside the glass. So you drop it. And when it hits the ground, the glass breaks, the pin flies off. And four and a half seconds later, the grenade goes off. Yeah, it's not very wrote, accurate. But I, you wrote it in your book. It's a, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Today, and, and a lot of guys did that. Yeah, okay. a lot of guys did that. So it was a little bit different. It's uh, different than flying, you know. But, you know, you talk to different bird dog pilots, and each one had a different mission somewhere. No, None of them were all the same. Friends of mine who flew bird dogs further north, they didn't do any kind of message drops. <laughs> they never okay. did a message drop. We did them down south, you know. It was just different kind of flying. A lot of times up north, they did convoy patrol or escort duty. If a convoy was leaving Long Bend and it was going up to, you know, whatever fire support base, they would have a bird dog overhead flying circles. So if they got into trouble, they could call for help or the bird dog could, you know, well, all they had was white phosphorus, but they could fire that. But they would call for help. Down south, we never did convoy patrol. Never. Okay. All different, all different.
Every bird dog pilot's different. A friend of mine that I went to flight school with, he read my book. And his comment was on Amazon, his comment was, he says, that's interesting. He said, because I flew up north a little bit further, a lot further up near Saigon. He said, I never flew anything like he did. He had excitement. I didn't have any. He said, I flew every night, every night at dark. And I'd go out over the jungle and I'd fly circles. And the guys on the ground that were on long range patrols, they would call me and go, hey, I need help, you know, whisper. And that's all he did. That's all he did. And he'd relay that back. And that's all he did. And he said four hours later or almost four, he'd go back and he'd land and go to sleep. Me, mine was, <laughs> mine was much different. Mine was exciting. His was boring. How was your last mission? Do you remember this? I don't remember it. Um, your last, the last week. Yeah. I, I left, I flew back to the States on February 20, 25th. Mm -hmm. of 1970 so i go back one day my 24th 23rd i was in rock jaw up to the 23rd and i know for my last week there i flew higher than i had ever flown <laughs> and i <laughs> And by then, uh, you know, you're not talking to Superman here. You know, I, I was like everybody else. So you flew a little bit higher. Um, and by that time, I already had my replacement there. So he did a lot of the flying. <clears throat> I didn't do, I didn't have to do a whole lot of the flying. Um, I laid around by my airplane trying to get a suntan because I always flew with, always had my, my shirt on. So I was going to get married one week after I got home. Okay. So I wanted to have a little bit of a tan, but I went over there uh, weighing 145 pounds. And when I came home, I was 125 pounds. So I was skinny. Okay. And I didn't want to look skin and bone. So I wanted to get a little bit of a tan. So my, my new wife wouldn't be afraid of me. We're still married. We're coming up on our 54th year. You absolutely, you look skinny. Uh, you sent, oh, yeah. you sent, you sent yeah. me this, this picture here. Yep. How skinny is that? Oh, man. <laughs> amazing, yeah. I look like I should be a teenager in high school. Yeah, you're so young. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. It wasn't, wasn't far out of high school, let me tell you. But that was my, that was my G model. It, one thing we were, that we haven't addressed yet, but did we ever get attacked on the ground? And yes, two times. Okay. Okay? Because remember, once you fly over that wire... That's, that's VC out there. So one time when I was in Sok Trang, back at that little bit bigger air base, I was attached to the advisory team there and we lived downtown. And I'll send you a picture of that someday too, but it was in a French villa, an old French villa with walls around it. And it was really very nice. Uh, it wasn't all that great inside, but I lived there for a month and a half. And one night, Right after I got there, about a week after I got there, we got uh, a mortar attack and I was I was laying in bed and you could hear the mortars when they exploded and they were walking it towards our building and the shrapnel was hitting the side of the building. Wow. Yeah. So that was one time. The second time was right here where you see me with this. See how I have the PSP down there? Uh, right across from that was my little runway right in front of it. You'll see that in some other pictures. And on that runway, a 60 millimeter mortar round hit one night. And it, it, it came in the direction of my airplane. And I got hit up there in the windshield. It put a, a hole about that big in my windshield, about like that. And then on the strut, right behind where I'm standing, there was a hole in the strut about that big. And that left-hand tire was blown out. So that was the only time I've, I've ever been hit there. Well, thank goodness nothing else happened. The Air Force always had them. What you see me right there, that's what you get. That's what I flew in. Okay? This was your, your flight suit, really? Okay. Well, I'm going to get to that part, too. But anyway, the, the, he had that survival vest. I had a canvas bag on my back seat with extra ammunition, um, uh, 
smoke grenades, stuff like that, sitting on my back seat. That's all I had. I couldn't carry it with me. Now, I did have, and you can't see it here, but it's underneath my Nomex. I carried a 38. Okay. Cowboy, like a cowboy holster, okay? You can't really see it. It's underneath my arm. But yeah. anyway, I flew with what you see there, Nomex. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I flew with Nomex because that was the safer of, of, of everything. You always flew with Nomex, okay? Mm -hmm. It was hot, but it was fireproof. The second thing is, look at if you look at my sleeves, you can tell that they come up and down every day because they're not pretty. You know, one sleeve is up higher than the other. Look at what I'm wearing. I'm wearing all leather boots. Okay. Uh... In a fire, my boots are not going to melt to my legs and my ankle. We didn't try to look our best. We we knew that anything could happen at any time. And I don't want to be a prisoner, but I don't want to be a burned up prisoner either. Yes. Uh, I so just... that's... I'm just searching for a picture of Rick Shoup because uh, Rick Shoup, uh, I met him in, in here, here he is. Okay. This was me, me and Rick Shoup. Yep. And, and, uh, but so this is Compton, the, right? That's, those are the combat fatigues that we were all issued. Okay. Okay. And he's wearing his right there. We were allowed to wear ours to fly as long as the sleeves were down. We used to fly with what Rick has sometimes. If we did, we only got issued a couple of pair of Nomex. And if they were being washed or something or getting repaired, we had to fly with the uh, with the regular ones that he's wearing. Okay. 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 But it sounds very smart because so you're fully protected if there's fire, yeah? You hope so, yeah. Yeah. Or well, at least yeah. you will make it some, some minutes yeah. more. Yeah. At least I can get out of the fire, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, we have to come to an end. My, okay, that's my, fine. my final question is, yep. uh, how was it to come home again? It was wonderful. Um, I flew back uh, from... Uh, uh, from you know why I asked you this question? You know why? Because no. you, you, sent, you sent me another picture. Uh, I think it's your dad beside you. And uh, let me just... And, and my mother... And and your mother and your your little sister. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what day. Yes, this is you. Here we go. That's that's my mother pinning my wings on me. This before. was when when you came home, or when, no, when you. This is, was before. This, this was one month before I left to go. Ah, oh, really? Okay. That was the day I graduated flight school. But you see, my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a lieutenant colonel. He's got his wings on too. So he was there, and that's my mom, and that's my little baby sister. She's now 63. <laughs> but that's, I was, uh, I was, uh, how old was I there? I was, I had just, no, wait a minute, let me, I was 20. Yep. I was 20 years old. I was the first lieutenant, but that's my dad, and that's my mom and my sister. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely yeah. amazing. And that's, yeah. that's about a month before I went to Vietnam. So I'm, Fred, I'm, I'm with you. I appreciate it. And I want to thank you for asking me to do this. There's so many people you could have asked to do this, but you picked me. And I appreciate that. And I'm, I really, I feel honored. I was a little bit nervous, I told you. But no, it's, never, it's amazing. Never, never be nervous around me. Vielen Dank, Fred. Vielen Dank. Bitte, gerne. Ich danke. Servus. Ja,